Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... At Villarey's Florist, we deliver the magic of flowers seven days a week to the North Shore and South Shore in the New Orleans area. Whether it's for birthday parties, baby celebrations, Villarey's provides colorful floral displays for all. With a store full of fresh cut flowers, exotic tropical flowers, orchids, roses, and even fruit baskets, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Villarey's Florist, proudly serving Louisiana since 1969. Dave Miet Insurance Agency. Auto, home, flood, business, 504-556-0809. Dave Miet, insagency.com. CNC Drugs is a family-owned pharmacy that's been serving Southeast Louisiana for over 50 years. Whether you need help taking care of an elderly family member, a growing child, or even a pet, CNC provides patient-centered care for your entire family. CNC Drugs, large enough to serve you, small enough to know you. Locations in Mandeville and Arity. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Over the next hour, we'll cover all the home teams that we do each and every week. Saints, LSU, Tulane, Pelicans. We'll talk about college baseball, college basketball. We'll get into all of it. And again, a uh, brand new media member uh, here to New Orleans. Not, not, and not, of course, the first a person that grew up in New Orleans and his inaugural visit to our show. And I got to tell you what, I've enjoyed watching him on Channel 4. He's done a great job. It's Seth Lewis. Seth, welcome to our program. Welcome back home. Thank you. Uh, and, and of course, we had Doug Mouton on a few weeks ago. Yep. Doug's raving about you. <laughs> uh, he had, a, had, to, you know, had to have you on, the pro, uh, on, 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 on Channel 4. And you know, welcome back to your home. And before we get started, uh, I always like well, for a, a, a new media member that comes on our program, get a mm -hmm. little background, let folks know a little bit about them. You know, this is kind of a laid back type show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So for me, I grew up in New Orleans East, right. uh, born and raised, and I have a Katrina story, like a, a lot of people, right, you know, here, which is just that my family moved to Opelousas, Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina, okay. and they never moved back since then. And so uh, for us, like, not only do I call New Orleans home, but I also call Opelousas home as well. How old were you? I was 14, 14 um, okay. when it happened. I was a sophomore. In high school. Where, where um, were you going to school? I was at De La Salle. At De La Salle? Yeah, De La Salle. You were a cavalier um, like myself? Yes, for sure. Okay. For sure. Uh, you know, I was I was in the band yeah. uh, at the time, playing okay. saxophone, killing it at saxophone. There you go. But, uh, but no, so, uh, you know, went from there to Opelousas Catholic, mm -hmm. was out there for three years, then went to LSU, graduated from there. And then, um, you know, to use an Avengers analogy, I say that uh, if I was the I-10 Thanos, I could snap my fingers at <laughs> right? this point because I worked in Lake Charles, Lafayette, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans mm -hmm. now. And so, uh, but my last market was Lafayette, which was my other home market, you know, right. Opelousas being a, um, a, a city 30 minutes from Lafayette. Spent six years there, the last two years as a sports director right. before coming over here. So, um, as I said in my goodbye in Lafayette, it was like leaving home to go back home. Oh, yeah. And so, that's been, that's been really cool. And... Uh, now being back here for mm -hmm. the first living here, I always visit it, right? Yes. I've never been that far away. The furthest I've been away is three hours. Mm -hmm. But uh, now living back here, I'm like, oh, man, did I miss it yeah. for sure. Coming back home, being at, a, again, a legacy station like Channel 4, talk about that. Oh, man. I mean, that was the station we watched oh, growing mean, yeah, up. Right. My mom cried whenever Hoda Kotb yeah. left the station. Oh, yeah. I, re I remember right, right, that. Right. I remember thinking, yeah. man, she's doing a lot for a reporter leaving town. Mm -hmm. But uh, but no, I mean, like, uh, working there <clears throat> and working where we watched so many legends mm -hmm. um, be yeah. and where so many legends still mm -hmm. are. Like, yeah. there's still uh, people there that, you know, I, I watched as a kid. And so um, it's been really cool. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there was, when I made my announcement 
for coming here. There was an image that my parents gave me um, from my LSU graduation, mm -hmm. and it was like an ESPN <clears throat> chair, and on the top of the ESPN chair was a picture of me on the set of WWL right. at the Children's Museum. Okay, right? yeah, yeah. And so when I made my announcement, I showed that picture from graduation day mm -hmm. of me at two, three years old right. on the Children's Museum WWL set, mm -hmm. and now all these years later, right. I'm here right. at WWL. I mean, it's just uh, amazing how God works. It really is. <laughs> and um, to be able to look back at that mm -hmm. and now be here, I could be anywhere in the right. city, but to be at WWL, right. um, it's really special. Right. For you, what, what drove you to sports? Man, well, as far as sports media is concerned, right. I couldn't play it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there you was, do there was, talk about no, it. Oh yeah, it's like, man, I, I know I like sports, right? Um, but uh, I know that it's probably not going to be professionally, mm -hmm. and it's probably not going to be collegiately either. Right. Um, you know, as, as I was just joking with somebody the other day, you know, in Opelousas, I was a 5'9 post player. You're not going very far <laughs> yeah, as a 5'9 yeah, post yeah. Uh, without, without some handles. And so, uh, you know, for me, um, I don't know, I, like for me, my love of sports, and this is, um, I don't know how many people can say this, mm -hmm. but my love of sports as a whole kind of came whenever the Hornets moved to New Orleans. Okay. You know, um, I so you weren't tell, a big Saints fan growing up? So what I tell people is I was a Saints fan before I was a sports fan. Okay. Right? Because I always supported my own. Like, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I always had city pride. But, you know, I was like, I was big into like Pokemon and okay. Power Rangers oh, yeah, okay. and yeah. different things like that. And then the Hornets moved here. And, you know, I started to watch them a little bit while they mm -hmm. were still in Charlotte. And I was like, wait, so a team can go to the playoffs mm -hmm. multiple years in a row? It, Sign me up. Right. <laughs> you know, like, because the, the, the Hornets right. were pretty successful yeah, at that were. time. Right. And so, um, and so for me, you know, that kind of piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. They got here. We went to the first game against the Jazz in mm -hmm. 2002. Right. We were in the arena for that. Yeah. Um, the Final Four came here mm -hmm. shortly thereafter mm -hmm. with, like, Carmelo Anthony oh, yeah. with Syracuse yeah. and Dwayne Wade with Marquette. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and was it was a, Texas and Kansas yeah. with Nick Collison and Kirk Heinrich. That was a great Final Four. Great Final Four. The atmosphere in the building mm -hmm. was a lot different than, mm -hmm. like, what I was experiencing mm -hmm. inside the arena, right. you know, with the, with the Hornets. And I just think all of those things. And it was like the things that, you know, calling myself a, a nerd from, uh, from being younger, mm -hmm. it was some of those things that, like, got me into it. Like, I started collecting basketball cards mm -hmm. and trading cards, football right. and different things like that. Um, I played a lot of video games. I was playing now Madden a little okay. bit more, and I was playing NBA Live a little mm -hmm. bit more. And so from kind of all of those things that I was already kind of accustomed to, mm -hmm. It just grew my interest more and more, and then you start getting into, okay, well, let's look more into baseball, mm -hmm. and let's look more into right. soccer, and let's look more into softball, you know, whatever the sport is. And, I mean, obviously now it's, it's through the roof. So I was yeah. a late bloomer, yeah. actually, when it came to, like, loving sports because right. it wasn't until, um, you know, 2001, 2002, I guess you could say, that mm -hmm. it really started to grow. But uh, from there, it just took off. My, me and my dad have been season ticket holders with the Saints mm -hmm. since 2002, 2003, okay. yeah. something like that. So, right. um, I mean, when it, when it took off, right. it took off for right. me. Last question about you. Did you always want to be in the media? Did you always want to be a, a, a reporter, uh, an anchor on television in, as, as, far, as a media member? So for me, I don't know if I always wanted to be on television. Honestly, in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to mm -hmm. be. I, I used to uh, I used to tell people, uh, man, when it came to like declaring a major, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just letting God guide my path. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and wherever wherever he takes me, and they were like, "All right, well, you you got to pick a direction at mm -hmm. some point. <laughs> you know, you can't use that line forever." Mm -hmm. And there was an advertisement um, in the newspaper in Opelousas mm -hmm. uh, called the Daily World for stringers, and yes. you didn't have to have experience. Mm -hmm. You could uh, be from high school or college, and so um, I took that on as a senior, and I actually ended up really liking it, writing um, for football. I had to stop because I was on the basketball team um, at the time, mm -hmm. so um, it was a conflict of interest with basketball, but uh, eventually, to keep a long story less long, I ended up quitting the team. I wasn't very good, mm -hmm. to be honest. And I started writing with basketball and baseball, and I ended up being at the newspaper for an entire year, 
where at times I was the only writer because we had editors that left. So like as a 17 year old, 16, 17 year old, I was the only writer in the wow. town newspaper writing four or five articles a week, five, six articles a, a week. A prodigy. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. And so uh, for me, once uh, high school was done right. and I was going to LSU, I was like, okay, well, I tried the print side of it. Let me try the television side of it in college. And if it doesn't work out, mm -hmm. then I know that it's, I can go back to print, print right. and it, it'll work out. But I got in the Tiger TV at LSU mm -hmm. and it was, it was love at first yeah, sight. Yeah, well, a great story. And again, welcome to our program. Thank you. Welcome back home. Absolutely. There you go. Let's talk Pelicans first. Pelicans 47 and 32. Uh, again, they are in sixth place in the West right now. Half a game in front of the Suns, who again played the Clippers last night on a back to back. Clippers did, they sat everybody. And of course, again, that didn't help the Pelicans. Pelicans go their own destiny here, though. They win the last three games, they got the sixth spot. Um, again, uh, uh, when uh, you look at the Pels tonight, taking on Sacramento. Um, uh, that'll be followed by Golden State on Friday, and then of course the finale in the, in, in the arena on Sunday against the Lakers. Um, your thoughts on the prospect of finishing in six? It's going to be tough, um, to be honest. It's going to be tough in part because, well, you know, they play the Kings, a team that they've beat four mm -hmm. times this right. year, and because of the end season tournament, they're getting the rare fifth game against an opponent mm -hmm. um, that that really never happens. And so it's going to be interesting. I mean, I, obviously, they have something against them. Jonas, whenever, see, whenever he sees his, uh, his countrymen and DeMontis uh, Sabonis, right. you know, he, he has uh, amazing games. Um, and he knows how to defend him pretty well, too. So it'll be interesting with the, uh, with the Kings. Um, but I think that it's going to be tough because I believe that the Pelicans are still like one of a couple teams in the playoff race mm -hmm. that have a losing record against uh, teams that are above 500, right? right? And they got they have to play three. Not only do they have to play three teams above 500, they have to play three teams that are fighting for the exact spot that they're looking for mm -hmm. in sixth, right? And so it's it's going to be tough, but if you can finish, if you finish 3-0, and it says a lot about the team. Yes. Because it shows that that killer instinct, mm -hmm. like it, it shows that will to win and that they're ready for the playoffs. But even finishing this stretch two and one, no matter if you finish in mm -hmm. sixth or seventh ultimately, right. if you're able to finish this stretch two and one, because everybody's going to be playing for something. The Lakers will be playing for something until the very end. The right. Kings will be playing for something until the very end. The Warriors may be playing for something until the very end, right. but they'll definitely be playing for something um, by Friday, yes. right? And so, because they, they would like to host that 9-10 mm -hmm. game mm -hmm. um, if, if they could uh, against the Lakers or whoever it is. Right. And so, if they can go 2-1 and one against teams that are out for blood, just like they should be out for blood too, I think it says a lot about them going in the, mm -hmm. into the postseason. Because in a series, especially if you have a, a fully healthy Brandon Ingram, mm -hmm. you know, I do like their chances like I, I'm not even necessarily predicting that they'll win a series but I think that it'll be really close with Brandon Ingram coming back in the mm -hmm. fold because Zion has shown so much growth yes. this season in his role and I think that he's going to be very hungry to show that what happened against the Lakers in the in season tournament mm -hmm. was a fluke right like he doesn't fold in the big moment that he's ready for the big moment so no matter who it is you got to get the right matchup you wouldn't want to see the Nuggets, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the defending champs, they to me would be my favorites to come out of the West mm -hmm. as of right now. You know, uh, I think it's them in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're playing a young team like OKC, the team that knocked them out of the play in mm -hmm. last year, right? Or you're facing a young team like Minnesota who's trying to add back Carl Anthony Towns but because um, he's had his health issues, but you still don't know how that looks. And, and Rudy Gobert sometimes in the, in the playoffs, you've been able to play him off the court. I think that um, if you're matched up against one of those teams, then you have a chance mm -hmm. for sure because they don't have a lot of experience either. Right. Brandon Ingram expected not to play tonight against Sacramento, but as you mentioned, the, Saint, um, the Pels have had their number. Um, what scares me is, again, going up against Golden State, going up against Los Angeles, again, with, with, uh, with the, uh, players that are, again, our future Hall of Famers, 
uh, teams that have won championships with, again, obviously you're back against the wall. Maybe Ingram is back for Golden State. What's the ramp up there in terms of, again, minutes for him? Will Najee be back at that point as well, again, which is, uh, which is huge for them off the bench? Uh, but again, they really kind of put themselves in this predicament going one in five in that homestand. And look, almost an unforgivable loss against, Sa against San Antonio at, at that point. I would, I would have to agree. I mean, obviously, whenever Zion's out of the equation, mm -hmm. it's going to make it a little bit tougher. Um, and the best player on that court would be uh, Victor Wimbanyama, who... You know, getting to see him up close and personal. I at one point I, I had to go down closer to the right. court to just see seven four move like that, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it was really Victor Wembanyama in the pips. You can't lose the Victor Wembanyama no, in can't. the pips. And so, and you have to win one of those other games mm -hmm. too. You know, like we're talking about Zion missing, but it's not even as big of a deal right. if you win just one of those other mm -hmm. games. And that's to that point of, I mean, this Pelican season as a whole has been successful, but there's been so many things that have been, I don't know if the right word is linear, right. but it's just been interesting. Like for example, um, they've had a sparkling record against bad teams. Mm -hmm. The San, losing to the San Antonio Spurs was the exception to the rule for mm -hmm. them. They've crushed teams that they've supposed to crush, right. and when you're a good team, you're supposed to do mm -hmm. that. But on the flip side, you're also supposed to be better against teams that are on your level. And when it comes to teams that are above 500, they have been under 500 this year against mm -hmm. those teams. You want to have a winning record against teams that are above 500 because, of course, in the playoffs, you don't get to see right. the Chicago Bulls who they lost to, so that's not the greatest mm -hmm. example. But you don't get to see some of those like sad teams yes. um, that's at the bottom of the barrel, like the Spurs as well. Mm -hmm. And so, and then even when it comes to the fourth quarter, I believe they are still the only team in the NBA that does not have a victory right. when trailing going into the fourth quarter. Right. In the playoffs, you're going to trail sometimes mm -hmm. going into the fourth quarter, and you got to dig deep and go get that. Um, I know before the Spurs game, they were 0 for 21 as far as trailing in the fourth mm -hmm. quarter and then, you know, being able to come back and, and win. And that's, that could be two points, that could be one point. Right. And so there's just certain things that are interesting and that are concerning um, about them as far as their playoff prospect. But in the same breath, they have so much young talent and mm -hmm. so much to prove. It just wouldn't surprise me as well if they got into the postseason and things looked a little bit different, even if they're not fully different. Right. I want to go in that direction because mm -hmm. this team set goals for itself. The, the fan base all in on those goals. Mm -hmm. They wanted to finish in the top six, okay, did not want to be in the play-in tournament. Uh, they wanted to win a series, okay, that was the next step for this team. Obviously, again, the big part of that was health. Uh, this team has not been healthy over the last few years. This is, again, Brandon Ingram's played more games than, than he's played since he went to the Los Angeles Lakers. This is the most games that Zion's played in his, in, in his NBA career, okay? Mm -hmm. If they don't finish in the top six, if they don't win a playoff series, how do you rate this season? Is I it a think, disappointing season? I think if they make the playoffs, I don't know if it's a disappointing season. Mm -hmm. um, I do know if they made the top six and didn't win a playoff series, uh, there's some positive to that because I really think that they might have to go 3-0 to mm -hmm. finish in the top six. It looks like You know what mean. I mean? They're, I mean, they don't... That's they they don't, what happened last time with the Clippers. Yeah, and, and, and they don't hold uh, that that stunk, and right. they don't hold all of the tiebreakers, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And so it just feels like it, it has to happen that way. So if they end up top six and they get that rest, I think that's something. Obviously, if they win a playoff series, it's a success. Mm -hmm. If they don't win a playoff series, I think it depends on who they go against, right? Um, if they go against the Nuggets, I mean... I don't expect them to win that series, mm -hmm. right? You know, that, maybe that, that's me doubting them. No, but no. I, don't, I really don't expect anybody to, okay. to win a series against the Nuggets mm -hmm. that's in the Western Conference right. right now, if I'm being honest. So, you, you, so it would really, depend in your, your mind, it would depend on the matchup. It, it would depend on the matchup, and it would also depend on how it goes down. Like, you know, obviously we're talking about two years ago, mm -hmm. and it was a different level in their progression. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when they took the Suns to six, and the Suns – were coming off of their finals run, mm -hmm. right? We looked at that, you know, we looked at that as like, oh man, like, you know, that was, a, that was a good run. Right. Now it's time for them to make this next step and then they didn't make the playoffs. Um, if they push 
Minnesota or OKC, because that's where it would be at this point, mm -hmm. um, at two or three. Or, uh, that's what at least what I would expect for it to be at two or three, but I guess the Nuggets could drop two. Mm -hmm. um, if they push the Nuggets or, I mean, um, the Timberwolves or the other team to, to six OKC or seven, nice. to OKC to, to six or seven games, I think then you just, it's, I think it's a successful season, mm -hmm. but I think the next step is imminent, right? right? Like, you, there is no more, like, waiting to see this team grow. And there may be a big move um, that's that's coming up, too. Right. I'm not necessarily uh, saying that, like, Willie Green gets fired mm -hmm. or anything like that. Right. Like, I, I, you know, I, I think that his job probably will be secure if they make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But maybe there is a move of one of the bigger pieces or you start pushing more chips into mm -hmm. the table because you got to start having results with a healthy Zion Williamson. And, and, and again, you lead me really to, to my next question because when you look at big picture, mm -hmm. okay, and you look at Oklahoma City, and you look at Orlando, and you even look at Houston, who won 12 games in a row before losing five. And this is what I've talked about on the radio show this week. Um, the Pels, a young team who's been injured, but you met, again, a plethora of first round picks because just like Oklahoma City, right? Uh, lottery team, they've chose to go in a different direction, okay? They've chose not to go young, to go in the lottery, uh, allow, uh, 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 acquire those young players, allow those players to grow in a lot of cases. They do have young players on this team, uh, but they've gone, they've gone again, the kind of mix with the veteran round. Uh, you look at Oklahoma City now, mm -hmm. top of the West. Mm -hmm. You look at Orlando, top four in the, in, in the East. You, you look at Houston and what they're doing, and you say, again, next year they're going to be a, a, a team on the come. If you're the fan base, if you're the ownership of, of, of the Pelicans, when you look at this and you're looking at the big picture, uh, will if they do not make make the top six, if they mm. do not win a series, uh, as you mentioned, is Willie Green uh, on a hot seat? Is David Griffin on a hot seat? And then is there a move possibly to start looking at this and saying, well, maybe the big three is not going to work here and we need to be able to get either go over the luxury tax threshold or make a big trade in the offseason? I think that something has to change, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the definition of insanity? Trying the same over, thing over and right, over right. again, uh, expecting a different result. Um, the good thing is this is really the first time, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. that we've seen Zion healthy, right? Right, right? That we've seen him play this many games. And he's looked good, too, right? He's, right? Like, he's, looked, in, he's looked really good at times. Not only, like, the offensive end, We've really never had a question about Zion mm -hmm. at the offensive Agreed. end. Um, he's shown that for several years mm -hmm. now whenever he's been healthy, right? True. I mean, he was an all-star last year mm -hmm. based on what he did in those 30-something games that he played before he got injured and never came back. Yes. But I think that um, – and then even on def – no, no, point, I guess, is on defense as well for him, he's also been um, extremely good. I think that – there's clearly talent on this team. Mm -hmm. You know, the guys have talked about it all year long as far as having 10 deep. You know, like, and it's not just like, oh, there's this one guy and he's kind of a fringe NBA guy. It's like, no, like, they have 10 dudes that would be in most, if not all, NBA rotations. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I agree they, with that. Like, they have guys that are coming off the bench that if you put them, you put them on the best team. You put mm -hmm. them on the Celtics, if you put them on the Nuggets, if you put them on the, if you put mm -hmm. Anaji Marshall mm -hmm. on the Celtics, he's playing for the Celtics. Yeah. He might get less minutes right. than right. he does but here, he's, he's but he's playing right. uh, for them. He's playing for the Bucks. Uh, he's playing for the Nuggets. Uh, if you put a, a Jordan Hawkins on on most teams, he's cracking their rotation because of what he can do and what he can give scoring wise mm -hmm. off of the bench. And so clearly, there's talent. I think there's a credit that has to go to Griff mm -hmm. to that. I agree. I think that when it comes to Willie, clearly, even in the times that they've struggled, he's never lost this group, mm -hmm. right? Like they clearly believe in him. Mm -hmm. They clearly love it. They they clearly love him. And he's grown yeah. as a coach. And he's grown as a coach. Right. Uh, sometimes people don't always give him credit no, for that. That's true, right? Right, right. But I, I do think he's grown mm -hmm. as a coach. Um, I think he makes more adjustments than mm -hmm. people give him credit for. Uh, them. And of course, there's well. going to be times that's, that's mm -hmm. frustrating and mm -hmm. things that you say, man, like, why wouldn't they do this? But uh, I would give him some more credit on that front. So, and I think having the ear of the locker room is really important in the mm -hmm. NBA when you're talking about 
uh, you see locker rooms all the time where people lose the, the yes. ear of the team. I mean, you look at Monty Williams, mm -hmm. former head coach here with the Phoenix Suns. Yeah. They're, in the, they're in the NBA Finals a few years ago, and now he's coaching the Pistons, mm -hmm. right? And who has the worst record in the league, sure. I believe, still. And so um, I think that the change is a big player, and I think that you look at any NBA champion, right, they always have somebody that's supernatural, mm -hmm. right? Like you can you can go down the list of previous mm -hmm. champions, like Jokic, like Giannis, like Kawhi, obviously LeBron mm -hmm. and Steph and KD and so on and so forth, right? You need somebody that's a superhuman. Mm -hmm. Zion fits the bill of superhuman. Agreed. He still has a long way to grow, mm -hmm. right, and a long way to go, but he fits the bill of superhuman. So if you're in the business of winning a championship, Zion's not the person that's leaving. The next person, obviously, down that list is Brandon Ingram, who's been great. And right. sometimes when your offense gets in a funk, he's somebody that can go um, isolation and go get you that, that 15, 17-foot foot, foot bucket. But they haven't always shown – like, they're a good fit mm -hmm. together. I'm not sure yet. It hasn't been proven yet that they are a great fit together. Mm -hmm. There may be better fits with Zion, right? And obviously Brandon Ingram probably gets you more value than, than some other people that's on the mm -hmm. roster. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's probably the move, mm -hmm. you know. But in the same regard, Brandon Ingram is the most respected person in that locker room. Like so many people look to him and helping them grow. That's Najee's, uh, one of Najee's best friends. Mm -hmm. That's one of Jose Alvarado's best friends. And, and um, he's helped Jose grow a lot. He's helped Trey grow a lot. Like, he's somebody that, you know, for his game and what some people might call, like, oh, he likes to play iso ball. He's, self mm -hmm. he's really an unselfish player. Yes, no. Uh, he's the leading assist guy on the team. He's the leading assist guy on the team, and he is someone that has never been um, – scared of sharing his spotlight, mm -hmm. not only with someone else that's a star like Zion, right. but like he's going to give the praise to like Jose and Najee and all those guys. So I, I think he, he doesn't get, get enough credit mm -hmm. for how unselfish he is right. and how much of a leader he is. But if they don't accomplish some of those things, mm -hmm. somebody has to go and it just unfortunately might be him. And it looks like, again, also from a contractual standpoint as well, he's got one year at, well on his deal left after this season. You're going to have to figure out what you're going to do. Are you going to sign him to a super max or not? That's got to play into this. That means sure. luxury over, going over the luxury tax threshold at that point. you got two years left with, with C.J. McCollum at $63 million. He's going to be 33 years old when they start the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the season next year. You know, is, th is that a situation there? you got to make a decision on Trey Murphy. He's got two years left on his deal. Again, is he going to end up getting uh, getting another big contract here? One year left with with Alvarado, uh, mm -hmm. and, and again, mm -hmm. Najee's a free agent. Uh, Valanciunas is a free agent. So again, there's going to be some moving parts there. For this year, is this roster flawed? And the reason why I ask you that is again, because when it comes to clutch time, they're not, they're among the worst teams in mm -hmm. the NBA at winning. Uh, we were again one of the things I think a lot of us talked about at the beginning of the season: point guard, veteran point guard and an athletic big. Mm -hmm. They chose not, they didn't want to break up anything because they wanted to see what they had. And I understand that. I do too. But but they, again, even at the trading deadline, they didn't go out and get that, that veteran point guard that maybe could have helped them in crunch time in the playoffs. Because we don't know if point forward is going to work, whether it be, whether it be Zion or, or Brandingham, mm -hmm. when you get into a half-court game mm -hmm. um, in, in the playoffs. That athletic big. You know, Larry Nance, I love him, but he looks like he's slowing down a bit here. They don't use Valentunas in a lot of cases like they should. Um, you know, that was something that I knew they tried to do at the trading line deadline, but they didn't get it done. Well, I mean, again, you're going into the playoffs now. I know you want to see how this team's going to react again in a, in a series, but those look like two fatal flaws for this team going in, and you didn't do enough to be able to, uh, again, fill those holes either preseason or at the, at the trading deadline. How do you think that affects them in the playoffs? Well, the clutch time thing is another thing that, you know, you look at it and it's kind of unbelievable. I mean, their first clutch mm -hmm. time win was the Spurs game in San Antonio mm -hmm. where Brandon Ingram gets the block off the backboard. Mm -hmm. They get to run it. Right. Zion, Williams get, Zion Williamson gets the layup and they, and they win that game. And I think that, uh, that started a streak for them. Yes. Um, it is something that's going to be interesting. And they should be a better clutch time team. You should be. They, right. they have players like Brandon Ingram mm -hmm. is somebody that can go get a bucket against anybody. Anybody. Right? 
um, Zion Williamson, he's still it's it's almost like a like a deer learning mm -hmm. how to walk mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as far as like clutch <clears throat> time is concerned because he's getting put in these situations really for the first time right. right and so I think that that is concerning I think that they also haven't had a whole lot of clutch time games like as as much as blowing out good uh, bad teams mm -hmm. has worked in their favor right sometimes it's good to uh, maybe play, uh, and I'm not advocating for them winning games by sure. less of a margin, right. of course, right? Of course. You win by as much as you need mm -hmm. to. But sometimes when you're playing the Wizards and it's a three-point game and that's not as good of a team mm -hmm. as the Bucks uh, in clutch time or, or, or whoever it is with like a Damian Lillard, it's good to have moments against a team like that where you can figure it out versus getting into a game uh, against the Lakers in clutch time mm -hmm. And then now they're staring at you with LeBron James right. and you have to go figure it out. Yes. And so I think that that's something that obviously it has to be concerning mm -hmm. going into the postseason. But I also think that they haven't had a whole lot of chances at fully figuring that out mm -hmm. either. And, and, and why it doesn't even CJ. Mm -hmm. CJ is somebody that he isn't beating as many people off the dribble now, right? right? But he is also somebody that should be able to go get his own bucket right. whenever you need him to go get his own bucket. And so I just think that them being so inconsistent mm -hmm. in clutch time is a concerning thing. But for whatever reason, among the other things, like that, I don't know why that concerns me less mm -hmm. than them not winning a game trailing going right. into the fourth quarter. Because when you don't win a game trailing going into the fourth quarter, you're bad at that. What it would tell you about most teams is that they're front runners, mm -hmm. right? Like right. they they play better right. from ahead, and then when they when, when the going wrong. gets tough, you know what I mean. Yes. And so like that to me is a little bit more concerning than even the clutch time thing, because the clutch time thing is like more of a sometimes guys don't know when to mm -hmm. defer to other guys, or guys don't you that's know what I mean. That's where again that veteran point guard comes in, and that's where the veteran point guard right. comes in. Uh, obviously, a Rajon Rondo type. A Rajan, a, yeah, like well, a, a Rondo that, type. That, that's, yeah, that's, sure. that's a Chris Paul type Chris Paul. at this point. Yes, right. absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. That, I think that's what they're missing. And, and again, I think it's a fatal flaw with the team. Look, I, everybody's excited. Okay, what, 42 games, okay? Uh, you know, they, they've been in contention for, for uh, in the West the entire time. But and, and make no question, this has been a good year. It has been a great year it's been, for it's been a, it's been a good year mm -hmm. statistically. Right. I believe they're still top 10 mm -hmm. offense and defense. Right. It's been a good year wins-wise. You know what I mean? Like the fact that they're still want, alive for 50 the wins. Step, right? But you want them to take the next step. I mean, that's the thing. And I don't want to be down on the Pelicans. No. I'm excited about what's going no. on. Again, let's be playoff basketball in New Orleans. Are you kidding me? But again, for this group, for this team, it's time to take the next step. I would Especially agree. when you see Oklahoma City and you see Orlando and then again Houston way in the background. You see these teams that again they've invested in the lottery and they're getting better and you know they're going to be better for a, a quite a few years. And now. I would throw, I mean, obviously they've uh, done a little bit of accelerating, mm -hmm. but I would throw Minnesota in there too yeah. with a young superstar yes. and Anthony Edwards. Mm -hmm. You know, so no yeah, you, you see teams like that and you see their growth and you see where they're going, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you stay there, no. right? Like you could take Memphis, for sure. example. Maybe they get back right. once John right. Moran gets mm -hmm. back, but like they had their little burst mm -hmm. and now they've kind of floated to the to the back of the pack. Sure. So it just because you have this rise doesn't guarantee that you stay mm -hmm. there. But you, using OKC, for example, you sure feel good when it's Shea Gilgis right. Alexander, when it's Chet Holmgren, mm -hmm. when it's Jalen Williams, yes. who's probably going to be the most improved player That's this right. year. Uh, I mean, when you look at all of those different guys and and uh, and some of what they have coming up, you're like, man, like yeah. that that looks well, a lot different. A lot different than what you got right now, mm -hmm. no doubt. Seth Lewis is our guest, uh, Channel 4 Sports. I'm Eric Asher. I'm your host. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports. We'll come back. We'll talk Saints. We'll get into the collegiate game. Uh, we'll hear from our underwriters. Stay tuned. Located at 3701 Iberville Street in Mid-City is Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Open seven days a week, Katie's offers daily specials for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Serving New Orleans cuisine such as fried shrimp platters, grilled redfish, and a fully stocked bar. And don't forget about our expanded event seating and local entertainment. Featured on the best of food networks, diners, drive-ins, and dives, Katie's Restaurant and Bar. 
Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating and Refrigeration has been family owned and operated since 1989. Burkhart has energy efficient solutions and offers brands such as Mitsubishi ductless AC units and Amena, the only manufacturer with a lifetime unit replacement warranty. Burkhart's offers maintenance bundle packages that include servicing your AC, generator and tankless water heater. For more information on the services Burkhart's provides, visit acpromise.com. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating and Refrigeration, providing comfort for He me. certainly has something to do with that, even though we are back. Again, uh, you're watching Inside New Orleans Sports. Seth Lewis is with us. I'm Eric Asher. Let's talk some Saints. All right. Um, huge draft for this team. Mm -hmm. uh, again, um, obviously a first pick at 14, second pick at 45, no pick in the, in, in the, in the uh, third and fourth round. Multiple picks in the fifth round, sixth round, seventh round. Uh, with the news of Ryan Ramshack uh, again, uh, having issues with his knee. Uh, with Penning, again, not knowing what he's going to be, where he's going to ultimately land on, on that offensive line. I think everyone that, that, that is looking at this is thinking offensive lineman in the first round. I, I've gone on the record as saying offensive lineman first and second round, okay? <laughs> I mean, I just think you need bookends. I think if you get anything out of Penning at this point, it's Lanyap. Okay, uh, you, you have to prepare for Ryan Ramshack. Maybe you keep him on the roster this year so you don't take a big hit on dead money, but at the same time, you got to be prepared in case he can't go. What are your thoughts on this draft coming up? Well, I would agree with you that offensive line is a huge thing, especially in lieu of the Ryan Ramchick mm -hmm. news. Um, I, I'm also someone, though, that even though that is what you should do, I'm also not a huge believer in mm -hmm. reaching, right? Um, I'm not saying that they reach for Trevor Penning, but like when you reach, something like that can happen, yes. right? Like where you're like, okay, I need an offensive lineman. Th like I have him evaluated a little bit lower than this, but like let me go get this guy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those things don't go the way that you want them to. And so um, I think offensive line is a big priority, but I also think that – this team has a lot of needs okay and so I think that no matter what direction they go in um, go address a need right like you need more help on the defensive line mm -hmm. this is one of the worst teams in the NFL as far as uh, generating sacks yes. last year right like getting to the quarterback and so um, adding another pass rusher mm -hmm. I think is also something that can help I don't think that I don't know if do you think they do that with Turner on the on the roster and and, yes. trying to, and also with Chase Young you think yeah. they, they yeah. I mean Chase direction? Young you know he's right. having neck surgery right. well, I agree. You know, we don't know you don't know, you know what Turner is now yeah right and, and I so agree. And, I, and I mean that doesn't mean that like I think Peyton Turner has a lot of potential mm -hmm. right and he could uh, turn out I mean obviously you still have uh, Carl Granderson right and then uh, Cam Jordan sure obviously Cam's getting older mm -hmm. but you can never count him out as a vet. But you'd like um, to be able to have other players that can maybe, again, not put so much pressure on him to be the guy yeah, every single sure, down, right? For sure. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I feel like you have to, that's that's an, another position that, that you have to look at. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, I think the Saints like um, Chris Olave, mm -hmm. right? And I think they like some of those other pieces, uh, like uh, A.T. Perry, like a Rashid Shaheed. But, I mean, even if they went wide receiver, in the first round mm -hmm. with a new offensive coordinator with trying to get mm -hmm. more weapons for Derek Carr like I don't think that's a, a bad route to go ultimately you just have to go in the route of whoever is best available based on what your your mm -hmm. needs are and if that happens to be offensive line then you 100% go and uh, make it happen because you are very unsure mm -hmm. about what's going on at tackle as of now with the hole in the middle of this draft how aggressive do you think they will be a lot of people believe myself included maybe those fifth round picks are going to be packaged to try to get back in the in the third or fourth round maybe those package those picks to move up or move down in the first round we know that again Loomis doesn't move down a lot but it's not that's not their MO yeah. This may be, again, a little bit of a different scenario this year with, again, so many needs and, and not enough picks. Yeah, I was about to say, uh, Loomis is going to make a move, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we know that. They have so many picks in that lower part. Right. There is no way that he holds on to all of those and doesn't. Because when the Saints like somebody, they, they go up and get right, them. They and, they've, and they've consistently and I, done and that. It might be a little bit of flaw in their philosophy, but Could they do be. it. Could be. And, it, it you know, there have been years where it's worked for them. Right. right? And then there have been years where it's crashed out. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, there's no chance that they sit on all of those lower picks, that mm -hmm. they are going to be aggressive and move up. 
I don't know if they move up in the first round, per mm -hmm. se. I don't know uh, if they have all of the, the ammo. And right. to be honest, uh, if the Saints are being honest with themselves, they know that next year mm -hmm. isn't a guarantee, right, mm -hmm. as far as uh, having success. Right. Um, like, you may be hopeful, mm -hmm. you may like what you have in the building, but you can't trade next year's first round pick right. in order to move up in the mm -hmm. first round, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like you have to look at that next round, that next year pick as right. we could be picking in the top ten sure. next year right. if it doesn't go right. That's if it point. goes right, then you right. know you win a division, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. Then yeah, it's a, it's a late first round pick, but that first round pick next year has so much value based on so many of the other things coming down the mm -hmm. line with this team. Um, and so yeah, first round. I'm pretty sure, if anything, stay at 14. they stand at 14 or they're trading down, Dang. but I, I think they probably mm -hmm. end up staying at 14 because, mm -hmm. like you said, Mickey Loomis doesn't trade down a mm -hmm. whole lot. But, um, but when it comes to some of those middle-round picks and some of the depth in this draft in general, I think that for sure uh, the Saints uh, trade up at some point. How do you think the Saints did in free agency? Again, a lot of one-year deals. Uh, again, a lot of prove-it-to-me deals. Guys that are coming in and try to maybe get a contract, have a great year, have a contract for a uh, big contract for next season. How do you think they did? I think they did okay, mm -hmm. right? I don't think they made a whole lot of splashes right. in in free agency. I think that there was uh, for fans. You know, fans wanted more mm -hmm. um, from free agency. You know, I mean, even somebody like a Chase Young, for example. You sign him, and he's shown flashes. Right. He's definitely shown flashes as a defensive end. And you're looking, and you're like, "Oh man, that, that might be a, that might be a good pick, mm -hmm. pick up." And then all of a sudden, you know, the announcement comes the next day that he's at, he, he's having neck surgery. And so, uh, I don't know if their free agency moves have given you any more confidence mm -hmm. about where they stand, but I don't know if it necessarily takes away from your expectation mm -hmm. either, right. to be honest. Um, let's let's shift gears to um, um, uh, to the collegiate game. I want to talk about the Lady Tigers first. They finished 31 and six, sixth in the final poll. Uh, they won 65 games over the last two seasons. A natty and an elite eight. Haley Van Lith is in the transfer portal. Uh, Angel Reese is going to going to the pros, the WNBA. Uh, that that draft is next week. Um, your thoughts on this year, mm -hmm. and then your thoughts on the future of this program. So. I think you can view it in multiple ways, mm -hmm. right? If you're looking at this season from literally after they won the championship mm -hmm. last year and you get the announcement of Haley Van Lith mm -hmm. is transferring in and Anissa Morrow is transferring right. in and you got the number one recruiting class mm -hmm. coming in, I think if you look at it from that perspective, then you're going to be disappointed, mm -hmm. right? Um, because this team was the odds-on favorite to win the national championship. Mm -hmm. I think once the season began and once you realized that this team didn't have a lot of depth, I mean, they lost, you know, n people didn't look at it as a big deal at mm -hmm. the time, but they lost Samaya Smith within the first couple weeks, and she would have played a really big role. I mean, mm -hmm. at one point they had moved Anissa Morrow to the bench right. in order to try her in the starting lineup with Angel Reese after they lost that game to Colorado uh, in game one. And so uh, losing her, you lost – a rotational piece. Mm -hmm. For a lot of the year, they were playing six or seven. Um, you know, and you look in, comp in comparison to South Carolina, mm. playing 10 is also typically unrealistic, sure. but South Carolina is that good. But you'd like to have eight. Mm -hmm. You'd like to have a solid eight in your rotation. Right. And in that run to the national championship, they had a solid seven or eight that they were trotting out there with uh, last tip Poa probably being that like eighth person that they could bring mm -hmm. with foul trouble or whatever else. And so there was just a point during the season where because of their depth, you had to wonder just how far mm -hmm. they could go. And I think that if you look at it from the standpoint of their depth wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. And even like you look at like Haley Van Lith, she never delivered exactly what you were expecting. Played out of position wise. though, right? She played out of position. Yeah. And that, and that and that that's the truth. And that's like, probably one of the reasons why she's in the transfer portal. And that's portal, probably right? one of the reasons why she's in the transfer portal because she's really a shooting guard right. and was playing point guard. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sure uh, when she came to LSU, she was expecting 
um, maybe to learn some of that mm -hmm. uh, from Kim Mulkey, but that transition just never yeah. fully worked out. Not to mention, too, I mean, we talked about um, Samaya Smith, mm -hmm. but Kateri Poole, you know, at one point in the right. season was no longer on the team. That's and right. that was somebody that you had as your starting point guard, mm -hmm. essentially in the uh, in the postseason last right. year, next to Alexis Morris. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that if you look at it from that standpoint, them reaching the mm -hmm. Elite Eight was good. I mean, it's a, it's a nice bow to uh, this run. I mean, not to mention, too, the committee did them no favors no. by matching Albany them up too? with Albany, too, oh, with Iowa. Right, right. You know what I mean? UCLA. Like I, a lot of people figured that they would get put into USC's region mm -hmm. in Portland. Yeah. And then that's a whole different deal. You know, not to say that, I mean, USC was a great team, mm -hmm. um, but if you lose to USC with Juju Watkins, a, a, a true freshman as the star, versus Caitlin Clark, the NCAA's all-time right. scoring leader, it's two totally different mm -hmm. conversations. So, and I mean, it's Iowa's a team that is right. a championship type team. They were in the championship right. game. And so if you view it from that, I don't, I mean, obviously it's still disappointing, um, but they still accomplished mm -hmm. a lot ultimately um, in this season. And yeah, so that's how, that's how I view it is mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, it's disappointing, but I think that if ultimately for them to make a championship run to win a championship, they were going to kind of have to pull some rabbits out the hat, mm -hmm. which they did last year in the tournament. Right. But can you do that two years in a row? That's going to be very hard. Let's go to um, football, LSU football spring games on Saturday. Um, obviously, again, Blake Baker comes in on the defensive side. Uh, some be some changes on defense. How they play Harold Perkins is, is one of the big question marks. Can they upgrade that secondary, that defensive line? I mean, all, all three phases really. Again, uh, I mean, all, all three positions on that defense um, uh, again are, are going to be uh, looked at very, very hard. Offensive line looks like again they're stout there. Unknown really at quarterback, wide receivers are unknown. Are unknown. I think they're solid at running back. I think they're solid at tight end. Give me your thoughts on this year's Tigers. Well, look, I think they're solid at quarterback too. Mm -hmm. You know, I've look, I've told friends I'm 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 in on the nuts bus. Okay. <laughs> you know, I think that there were you know when it came to like coming into this mm -hmm. season, and there were certain fans that didn't understand why Nuss wasn't getting a fair shot against Jaden Daniels. Well, that was always crazy, even before you went on his right. Heisman run, because. Um, Jaden Daniels showed so much in that first year with LSU mm -hmm. where it was like, man, if he could just get over the part of not making mistakes, mm -hmm. he's going to be really, really good. And I love the line that um, Brian Kelly told him, which is, we don't want perfection, we want excellence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you don't have to tell uh, Nuss that we don't want perfection because he let it fly. <laughs> right. Uh, but I think his arm talent... Uh, I think being able to watch Jaden Daniels for mm -hmm. the last couple years, be in Brian Kelly's system for the last couple years. I mean, in this transfer portal era, he chose to stay. Right. Right. And I think that says something too. Mm -hmm. Right. And the keys are his now. And so, um, you know, I, I think that I'm, I want to see what Nuss does, but I'm excited also to see mm -hmm. what Nuss does because I think that Nuss has a lot of potential. Um, the wide receiver position is going to be interesting, mm -hmm. right, with your top two guys and Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas uh, Jr. going to the draft. There's some talent uh, there, though. There's some talent. Kyron Lacey uh, showed improvement, mm -hmm. right? Um, he, he showed improvement this year. The, the question now is can he be a number one receiver, mm -hmm. right? Um, he's kind of been that before when he was with the Raging Cajuns in, in, in Lafayette, mm -hmm. right? Um, but now can he be a number one receiver in the SEC? Um, and then defensively to what you were talking about with uh, with defensive coordinator Baker, yeah, I'm really interested to see exactly what changes mm -hmm. he brings. Me too. And exactly how he brings the best out of Harold Perkins, yeah. right? Um, LSU in college football can be driven by star power. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it's an 11-man game, right. right? But you do need stars. You need guys that can take over. We've seen mm -hmm. that from Harold Perkins in the past that he can literally take over a game. And so I'm really interested to see exactly how he utilizes him. Um, there's a lot to replace on that defensive line, yeah. right? Um, but And so that's going to be also very interesting to see exactly how they fill some of those holes, mm -hmm. some of which I don't even know is completely done yet. There's probably more to be done 
in the transfer portal as far as like getting depth uh, at mm-hmm. defensive tackle. But um, but those are some of the things that that I'm most interested in is seeing exactly how Harold, Harold Perkins is utilized mm-hmm. and then seeing what Nuss can do because I mm-hmm. think Nuss is going to surprise some mm-hmm. people right. at how well he plays. Spring game on Saturday, playing a scrimmage last Saturday. Your thoughts on on the John Summerall era and you know what he has to work with now and what again uh, what his team may look like next season. Well, I tell you what, uh, on paper and in talk. I think there's a lot to be excited about, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Obviously, you know, Tulane has accomplished so much in the last couple years with Willie Fritz Mm -hmm. um, and that era and um, winning a title in the American and then obviously getting back to the championship game. Um, But I think, you know, when you're bringing in somebody for Coach Sumrall, like a Ty Thompson, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, it's hard to replace somebody like Michael Pratt. You can't replace somebody like Michael Pratt. I mean, he was uh, great for four years there. Mm -hmm. But when you bring in a five-star transfer like Ty Thompson, that's exciting, right, from from Oregon. Um, And then, you know, Kai Horton is still there. Kai Mm -hmm. is definitely going to be a a big part of that quarterback competition, too. And they're saying Mensa's in the mix now, too. And Mensa's going to be in the mix, too. You know, and it's going to be interesting to see Mm -hmm. um, how – how long that stays a, mm-hmm. a three horse race, right, 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 right? Or you know, if it if it goes down to two at some point mm-hmm. or whatever it is, and who the two are, right? In this era of transfer portal and NIL, um, some as well as you got to keep guys happy. Yeah, you got and and, and 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 as a coach, you got to let Mensa know he's in the mix, you, right? You got to let Mensa know right. he's in the mix. And from what I've seen in practice, Mensa's look good. Okay, you know what I mean. So he he really may be in mm-hmm. the mix, but. Also, you do have to keep people in the mix, too, mm-hmm. so that people just don't jump ship automatically right. as well. Right. But, I mean, you look at Ty Thompson, you look at a local guy like Shaz Preston mm-hmm. um, that they, they brought in. You look at Mario Our Williams, Williams right? uh, coming from USC, who was, um, who was highly t- touted, obviously. Um, there are some names that have been brought in, um, even a couple guys that have come from Troy mm-hmm. with Coach Summerall that have some good experience. Uh, I think there's a lot to be excited about with Tulane. And Coach Summerall mentioned um, in his mm-hmm. introductory press conference about, okay, we want to be in the postseason. Like, we, we, we plan to be in the playoffs. Well, in this era, with it going to 12 teams, mm-hmm. with uh, it's the top five champions, right, the big four, yes. as well as the next best team um, out of the group of five, Tulane's put themselves in a position, obviously paper won't win you anything, Agreed. but Tulane's put themselves in a position with some of the talent that they've mm-hmm. acquired and some of the talent that they've kept, too, uh, I might add. Everybody didn't leave for Tulane. They, right. they have some some really good guys coming back, mm-hmm. like Makai Hughes at running sure. back, like Patrick Jenkins at defensive line. Sure. I mean, he's, he's a dude. He right. looks like an SEC defensive mm-hmm. lineman. No doubt. And so um, keeping some of those guys, bringing in some of those talent, mm-hmm. and the AAC kind of setting themselves up like – it's not the strongest conference mm-hmm. overall, right? But the top is really good mm-hmm. in the AAC, probably paced by Tulane, especially now that SMU has moved on to the Agreed. AAC. And so I think that Tulane is putting themselves in a really good position in this new 12 team mm-hmm. playoff era to be one of, if not the premier team right. in the group of five. And if you can't get excited about that as a Tulane fan, I don't I, know what to tell you. I agree. You. And then they'll get, they need to be in that stadium as well. That's that's another part of it. And of course, the facilities are big. They they have the the, the, the Wave Collective, which is helping with mm-hmm. NIL, which again, you got to have. They seem to be on the right foot. And look, this is a heck of a coach. Yes. It's a heck of a coach. I mean, this is, this is a guy who really had an opportunity to take power five jobs. Mm-hmm. But yeah. as he mentioned, right. power five doesn't necessarily mean successful. So he wasn't caught up mm-hmm. in that. Like Agreed. you can go to a power five job and not have the tools to be mm-hmm. successful. Tulane gives them all the tools to be successful mm-hmm. in the AAC. Right. And if you make it into the playoffs, right. I mean, well, and again know. for him, the next step is the SEC or, or a big or a big sure. conference, and he's sure. going to use this as a stepping stone, which is good because that means Tulane's being successful. Yeah, I was just about to say, if it, it's much better when people are being promoted than five. That's right, no <laughs> doubt about it. All right, I want to get into baseball for a minute. We only got about three minutes left in the show. Let me quickly go through this for the audience. Um, Tulane, 18 and 15, three and six uh, in the American. They're eighth. They got South Florida at home for three this weekend. UNO, 18 and 14, six and three in the Southland. They're 
tied for second right now uh, with Nichols. They got three games against Bluefield State uh, at home this weekend. Nichols is 23 and 11, as I mentioned, tied with um, with uh, uh, UNO. They got Northwestern State at home this weekend. Southeastern 19 and 14. They're eighth in the South and a three and six. Uh, they play against first place Lamar at Lamar this this weekend. Uh, ULL. 25 and 9. They lost their they lost the, uh, their first game in the last 17 last night to Louisiana Tech. Uh, they're the only ranked team in Louisiana at 19. Louisiana Tech again with that win last night goes 26 and 9. Uh, they're 6 and 3 in the CUSA. They got Arizona this weekend. By the way, uh, ULL has Marshall at home this weekend. Nola Gold fifth place uh, in, in in their league. They got they lost to Chicago last week. They got San San, uh, San Diego uh, in San Diego this weekend. I got to get to LSU. I got about two minutes left. Uh, they beat McNeese the other night, 22 and, and, and 12, 3 and 9 in the SEC. They got Knoxville this week. They got uh, got run ruled again. Mm -hmm. They lost uh, um, uh, their first four SEC uh, uh, series. Talking about the Tigers, got about two minutes. Uh, it's uh, disappointing, I'm, you know. I mean, coming off of the championship run now. I, I think it was always going to be hard to follow up a run like that, you know. I but mean, one of the greatest like runs, but out, the huh? bottom seems like it's dropped out a little bit. And obviously this team still has talent, mm -hmm. but I don't know, especially when it comes to like pitching wise, that it's it's developed the way that they thought it would. Right. And I'm saying pitching wise, but I mean, even as far as when it comes to scoring runs, it's not like they're losing games 12 to 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, being run rule three times. But I will say this, though. This is a reason why I would, right. I would tell a friend of mine this um, who was an LSU fan. Um, <clears throat> I was like, man, people were complaining last year mm -hmm. when they were winning series, but maybe they lose game three and the relief pitching didn't look good. Right. And I'm like, man, the people that are worried about what's going to happen in the postseason, they are missing a really good season, mm -hmm. right? Um, they're, they're not appreciating this. Right. And the fact that they're beating everybody, mm -hmm. right? Everybody that's put in front of them is beating. It just goes to show it's tough, man. No, the SEC is really very tough. tough it's just well. really tough in the SEC. And if you slip a little bit, right, right it's not only that you're losing, mm -hmm. it's you're getting run rule. Right. So uh, I think, but in a weird way, and I'm not advocating for LSU turning mm -hmm. this around, but I told this to Doug the other day. Mm -hmm. When Alabama played LSU last year, mm -hmm. they were a bubble team. When they, they had their gambling scandal yeah, and all yeah, of those remember, different yeah. things. They went on a run after that, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they were hosting. Auburn beat LSU in a, in a three-game series, mm -hmm. and they went on a run, and all of a sudden they were hosting. So it's not impossible right. for a team to turn it around. It's just a little bit harder to conceive when you're getting run ruled yeah, in that fashion. It is, and of course, going and again, the the first part of this SEC schedule has been so tough for them, mm -hmm. and it doesn't get any easier going to Knoxville this weekend. No. And, uh, you, and you know Tennessee's going to want. Oh, revenge. you know it. Uh, yeah. And that, that, those fans. Blood are, is in the water. Oh, you better yeah. believe it. They yeah, see right. it coming, no doubt. Yeah. Seth, thank you. This has been outstanding. Yeah. Appreciate you joining us Thanks again. You're everything that again that Doug tolls you are going to be. I'm excited about you being back home and would uh, going to have you on the radio show soon. And we'd love to have you back on the TV show. Thank you for having me. And thanks for being with us. Again, uh, Seth Lewis, uh, WWL Channel 4 Sports. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in. So many ways to catch our program now. There's a QR code on your screen that'll take you right to my website, ericasher.com, or the WLE TV YouTube channel. Uh, click on that. Of course, again, that, that'll, uh, that'll keep you in touch with the program. Also, remember, set the DVR. So many ways to catch our program now. I'm on Pelican Sports Television, WLE TV 2. Also, again, WLE TV. Set your DVR. You'll never miss the program. You catch me on the radio four to six weekdays, 106.1 The Ticket. You can listen live at ericasher.com. Also, again, 106.1 The Ticket. iHeartRadio, uh, TuneIn Radio app, our digital platforms. On Anchor Spotify, that's where you get our podcast. We're on all podcasting platforms. And, of course, as always, want to thank our underwriters who make this show possible. Well, please, again, support the underwriters who make the show possible. And I want to thank, again, our, our crew here at WLE-TV who produce our program. Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, Logan Graffia, uh, Danielle Wick, Jane Wright, uh, Alex Chacon, and the best director on the planet, William Hill. For Seth Lewis, I'm Eric Asher. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports.